Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Last lecture. Last lecture. Last lecture. Come on. Okay. Let's get this over with. Final suspense. So, um, what I showed in showed you in the previous lecture, lecture number three, was this apparent phase transition in a different model in which you put inhibition and then some oscillations appear and there's some kind of transition region where you have continuously varying exponents which match the data, experimental data of different ex experiments. It's bad? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, to turn Robocop. Robocop, it's, this guy follows me, it's, yeah. It's horrible, I have no idea keeps looking at us. So, OK. Yeah, so now we're going to, to revisit this, this issue of a different phase transition and, and in an experiment. So actually, the, 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 the full title of this talk is the one, <laughs> the one uh, that's the title of the paper that we published with those results. So this is, since this is the last lecture, Please allow me to just go back a little bit and just revisit some of the things that we talked about since the first lecture very quickly because we've been there already, just so we can put things into perspective. Um, the whole point is that if you assume that the brain does undergo some kind of phase transition, you have some control parameter, which I don't know what it is, and some order parameter, which I also don't know what it is, and if you somehow uh, are able to d define avalanches, then it is expected that at this critical point you have this power law distribution of sizes, of, of avalanche sizes, and power law distribution of avalanche durations with those two exponents defined like this, which is what is written here. Now, so the current standard model for uh, neuronal avalanches, I was, I was telling you in the two previous in the two first lectures was, is this mean field directed percolation in which the subcritical, in which you have neurons collected by probabilities, and if probabilities are small, you go to the absorbing state, the subcritical regime. And, uh, if coupling is strong enough, you go to the subcritical regime where you have uh, stable activity, and in the critical regime, you are on the verge of dying and not dying. So that's a phase transition between absorbing and active phases like I showed you a couple of times already. Nice. And these are the two critical exponents for this universality class, like I wrote here. And revisiting the issues that this um, model has, just revisiting them and showing a couple of new ones, new data. Because of, of, of the absorbing state, it's very hard to imagine how this kind of model could reproduce long range time correlations that are, that are observed in freely behaving animals, like I showed you in the second lecture, uh, and in human data, for instance, like I showed you in the previous lecture, the third lecture. Experimentally, the avalanche exponents are not always tau equals 3 halves and tau t equals 2. So I showed you the bags of plans experiment. Uh, with, as you vary the beam, the, expan the exponents change. I showed you the MEG experiments. We have this spread of exponents. Let's go back to a, a, a another kind of experiment, just to give an another example. Um, this is was experimented done by Woody Shu and collaborators. This is uh, Dietmar Plant's former postdoc, a in Nature Physics, 2015. So this is not even, this is not in vitro nor in vivo. It's called ex vivo experiment, in which we move the whole brain of the turtle from the turtle skull, uh, skull, uh, skull and stimulate the visual, the retina of the turtle where, while you're measuring with some multi-electrode array uh, the activity in the visual cortex of the turtle. 
for some reason that apparently is a very convenient uh, experimental system. I don't know why, but apparently it is. People like to work in the turtle. And you can do the same thing again and again. So you have some stimulus, you have some electrical activity here. You put a threshold, you have binary events, you have some time bin, you define avalanches, and then define size distribution of avalanches and duration distribution of avalanches. OK? The, thing, the same thing I've been talking to you about for a long time. So you do this. And when you do this, you obtain distributions which have such variability in the values of the exponents that the way they chose to show the results was, again, with a plane of exponents. So this is tau and tau t plane. The exponents are varying so much that you, they can spread along a plane. And we have seen things like this before, right? So we have seen exponents that spread along a straight line like this, more or less. Please note that without a better model, the standard model is mean field director percolation, which has tau t equals 2. This is tau t. This is 1.8. This is 2.8. Tau t equals 2 is this line. Please check if it's correct. It is. And tau equals 1.5, 3 halves. This is 1.6. So 1.5 is somewhere here. So this is the current theory for it to explain this data. Mean field director percolation. You make your judgment whether it's a good model or not. OK? And let me go back to my second lecture, the hard one, the, the messy one, with lots of conflicting results. Previous results that I've, that I've shown you, briefly I'm going to revisit them, also suggested an intriguing dependence of power law distributions on the level of synchronization, which again has nothing to do with mean field directed percolation. Remember, uh, I showed you this paper from, uh, from 2010 in which we, we had like freely behaving animals, but we also had, we also had ketamine xylazine anesthesia which have this very uh, uh, synchronous activity, more synchronous than this one, for instance. And this is a kind of uh, anesthesia from which you can wake up. So anesthesia wears out eventually with time. So you, we, we can take, we can apply some deep anesthesia and measure probability distribution of uh, avalanche sizes. And so this is deep anesthesia. You get a reasonable power law. And as the animal awakens, you take a different curve every 30 minutes, see? And this power law gets, starts to bend down, down, and down until the animal is fully awake and you're back to the block normal distribution. So you can see the morphing of a power law distribution into a, a log normal distribution as the animal awakes. So if I want power loss, what I get, I get power loss when it's more synchronized like this, but not when it's like this. And again, when I do get something that I can reasonably accept as a power law, the exponents are not always 1.5. A little bit here, a little bit there, fluctuating. So we, we keep seeing kind of this variability emerging over and over and over with this ingredient, with this ingredient of the now, this new ingredient of synchronization which was not in our radar if you're talking about directed percolation. Because directed percolation is about silence and non-silence. There's no talk about synchronization. It's nothing to do with directed percolation. Right? So again, just revisiting, I mean, summarizing a couple of slides, the previous three lectures, in the sense that maybe it's time for mean field directed percolation to go as the standard uh, model or the standard understanding of what's going on. Because, OK, it's nice, it's, there's some pros, but several, several cons. And there's a lot of experimental data that has to be explained. And we cannot do, I cannot do this with this kind of model. Huh. So it's interesting to go back in time, a couple of almost a century, 
just to revisit this, this whole thing about synchronization leads us to what were originally called as brain waves, perhaps, which is oscillation that we see in the brain in different scales. So uh, in 1924, almost 100 years ago, this guy measured uh, EEG, electroencephalography, uh, the first time in humans. He hadn't measured before in, in animals, but in humans was the first time. This is his original signal, and he, this is a 10 hertz reference to show that you can get think something that looks like 10 hertz in your head. This is called alpha oscillation that you obtain in, your, in the back of your head if you close your eyes. So this is, I mean, I didn't find a picture of the original experimental setup. Uh, a contemporary one will look like this, in which you can have up to, I don't know, 128. I don't know what's the kind of standard, maybe 156. Many, 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 many electrodes in, in, the, in the scalp. And the beauty of the technique it's that it's non it's that uh, it's non-invasive, so I didn't find a picture, but there are many of of uh, small, very small child wearing one of those helmets and smiling. Okay, it doesn't get uh, less invasive than that. You put in a child and it smiles. Okay, and the child smiles, right? And so that's the beauty of the technique. And what is the problem of technique? That you're trying to measure electric signal across the the dura, the the bone, and the the, the skin, and the hair, and everything. So it's a very dirty very noisy signal, but it's not invasive. So. And this has turned almost into pop culture. You can go to the side and buy this equipment, which has a couple of channels, not 128. You put it in your hand, and you connect the device to your cell phone and follow the meditation instructions. And the device will measure how much you have in, in the different frequency bands and how relaxed you are, gives you a score, and then compares you to some Buddhist monks who are going to do much better than you, of course. Right? So, uh, but interest, so you can, they have a promotion for Father's Day. It's about 100 bucks if you want to buy one of these. Okay? And the, the, the nice thing is that one of the best uh, summaries of the different frequency bands that are observed in the brain. I found this is a commercial site. Uh, they, they, they represent it nicely like this. So alpha band between 8 and 13 hertz. By the way, it's the same frequency that appeared in the cross model in the previous lecture. And when the oscillations emerge, that's what you observe in your EEG if you're physically and mentally relaxed. The beta band, 13 to 32 hertz. Awake, alert consciousness, thinking, excitement. Gamma band, it's heightened perception, learning, problem solving task, cognitive processing. Alpha, beta, gamma, and then delta goes back here. I don't, never understood why. This is when you're deep, dreamless sleep, so slow you sleep probably. Loss of body awareness, repair. Theta band, creativity inside. So what it means that oscillations in the brain is not a new thing. <laughs> They've been there forever. They've been classified more or less according to behavior. They've been related to behavior for a long time. And I'm talking here just about this very basic level, very uh, superficial level, which is EEG, very dirty signal. Uh, things have evolved considerably with time and technology and techniques as techniques evolved. So um, now you can, okay, perhaps not necessarily with humans, but with, with animals, you, you can insert electrodes. This is the, these are the six layers uh, of the mammalian cortex. You can instead of an electrode and measure local field potential, like I've been mentioning in the last, uh, last lectures. At the surface, you see some kind of oscillations. If you insert deeper through LFP, you can also see the oscillations a little bit better because there's less attenuation. And in the most, in the strongest uh, regime here, you can insert an electrode inside the neuron. It's very hard to do. And then you measure, make an intracellular measurement, and you can see all the spikes in detail. And you can see even the, the regime of those spikes, you have so this modulation of oscillations here. So this is local field potential. These are spikes. Um, there are people in the world who work on intracellular recordings with live animals. It's very hard to do. Because you see, this, this thing is 10 microns across. So if you have to have a very stable setup, otherwise, you just kill the. the, the the neuron, and that's it. Your experiment is done. So here is a signal, uh, some examples trying to compare these different signals. So you have EEG 
Please note the scale here is like 150 microvolts. Uh, LFP, you had 800 microvolts because, of course, you're inside, right? EG, you're, you're outside this, the, the, uh, the skull, on top of the scalp. Here, you're inside the brain. Um, here is what you, the raw signal, if you're trying to measure spike with a high um, pass filter. And this is the spikes after you have processed the signal and try to extract the discrete events that occur in your network. So there's a lot of processing before you reach the, the, the spikes. And it just turns out that so this uh, understanding of, of brain, brain waves that you can clearly see in electroencephalogram uh, can also appear in spikes at this level, which is, let's say, the spike is like as considered the, the minimum information uh, unit that you could have at, at each neuron. So it's a more, much more detailed information. So what is the current, more or less, current status of the situation when you try to relate these brain waves with spiking, at the spiking level? Um, this is a very nice review paper that I recommend by Harris and Tillian, Nature Reviews of Science 2011. So I'm going to talk about these cortical states, which I'm going to define. So the brain continuously adapts its processing machinery to behavioral demands. To achieve this, it rapidly modulates the operating mode of cortical circuits, controlling the way that information is transferred in relative. In a way, perhaps, going back to one of Gabriel's questions yesterday, Right? The animal has to do different things here, there, here, and there, different stuff. It has to harness its brain capacity to do different stuff. And these changes are related, can be measured not only behaviorally. You know when your son is asleep or when he is awake, right? So we know animals as well. And th there are the, the electrophysiological, electrophysiological counterparts of these behavior, different behaviors. So. Um, a bit of jargon, because jargon is terrible, because it differs in different areas. What a physicist calls a state is like, if I know the state of the system, I know, I mean, classically, I can determine its futures if I know the dynamics, right? Here, state is a little bit different for in neuroscience. They call it a cortical state, the dynamics of network activity on a time scale of seconds. More specifically, the kind of dynamics of a network activity on a time scale of seconds. So it's not this a state in the physical sense more strictly. It's more like a phase, if you want, roughly speaking. It would be a phase. In, in, or a thermodynamic state, for instance, in, in physics, perhaps. And what is known, more or less today, more or less well established, is that you do observe this kind of synchronized state that I'm displaying here. I'm going to. Uh, um, I'm displaying here, I'm going to explain in detail in a, in, a, in, a, in a while. If the animal is drowsy, quiescent, or in slow wave sleep, for instance, these are instances where if you're measuring spikes, uh, spikes, spikes, or local field potential, that's the kind of thing you're going to see when the animal is doing that. You can also observe the dis desynchronized state when the animal is actively behaving, alert. That's the kind of thing you, that you will see. So more specifically, uh, if you look at local field potentials, you'll see these low freq frequency fluctuations, whereas in the desynchronized state, you'll see less low frequency LFP fluctuations. You, you see a um, um, weaker uh, spectrum. Spiking activity is correlated in this kind of cortical state. Clearly, you see, they are correlated. I don't have to, to, to calculate anything. You just look and see that spiking. Pairwise correlation is high here. And you can actually do the this is a distribution, a histogram of pairwise correlation. This is correlation zero. What you measure experimentally is that in this kind of regime, you're uh, biased to the right, to positive correlations, pairwise correlations. Okay. Whereas here, you see uncorrelated spike in activity in the sense that if you try to do the same kind of histogram, you see a pairwise 
correlation uh, centered more or less around zero. So we have some, some mirrors which are positive correlated, some which are negative correlated, not much, and on average you get some kind of something near zero. So these are just things that you verify experimentally in different animals and kind of well documented. It, it, turn, it turns out, however, that uh, cortical state is not bimodal. It's not true that you have synchronized states and a desynchronized state, and that's it. Essentially, this division I put here was just for pedagogical me ends, but in fact, what you, what you have is a continuum. You go from completely very synchronized to very desynchronized. And you can, in principle, go along this axis. I mean, not that you can go the, the animals, we. Oh fluctuate or, or go around this and this region here. If you are slow asleep, you are more toward this region here. If you are attentive, trying to do some task, you are here. And there's kind of everything in between. You can be kind of attentive. Sometimes you see this in classrooms, right? The student is there. His body is there, but not his spirit, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we've all been there. So. Given that, the question uh, um, I would like to ask is, is the following. Can we explore this continuum to try to solve this conundrum between criticality and synchronization? The thing that appear in ketamine, xylazine, anesthesia, for instance, these waves that keep appearing in the cross model, these oscillations that appear also in the EEG data, MEG data. This messy scenario in which we were left after all of the things I, I said, can we try to solve it? And if we do, how can we do it under some kind of control? And this is when uh, urethane comes into the picture. Urethane, Gabriel was telling us yesterday, it's a kind of anesthesia, which, which is a different one. It, it allows uh, sensory information to do to go through, and it has also some other properties. Differently from ketamine and xylazine, in which you have these strong oscillations that, and that's it, urethane is different. Urethane is a kind of anesthesia that, in which the animal goes from something like this to something like that, and then something like this, it goes here and here, it just goes along this, continuous, this continuum in a kind of random way as I'm going to show you in a minute. So what I'm going to try to do is that I'm going to apply this full stress test of criticality that I apply to the cross model to the experimental data. Let me remind what the full stress test was. If you can define avalanches, then size and duration should be parallel distribution. But not only that, given some duration, capital T, the average size should scale with T with some combination of critical exponents once over sigma nu z. For us, it suffice to call this just once one uh, critical exponent, doesn't matter. And then the really hard one the really hard one, if those three are satisfied, then those exponents are not independent, but rather one over sigma nu z should equal tau t minus one and tau minus one. 
And even though my statistical physics is kind of a bit rusty after working with neuroscience for so long, I think I can still prove this and it's kind of easy. So it's an interesting exercise in statistical physics since we are all going to start phase next week, right? So the thing is like this. If you are, you just assume that this is the probability of finding uh, a size between S and S plus dS, right? This is, this is the probability density. And it has some size S, some duration T. Uh, the probability is the same. It should be there in the same interval. And then you can uh, integrate this thing, for instance, from um, prime, 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 so nobody complains. So from S to infinity here, from T to infinity here, right? And so since this is a power law, S to the minus tau, this will give you an S minus tau plus one, right? And this will give you a T to the minus tau T plus one. But now, if you assume that given a duration T, your size S is this mean, and then you don't have that many fluctuations, I'm not talking about the, this heavy tail distribution. I'm, I'm talking about the conditional probability here of S given T. That can be narrow. And therefore, I can replace this thing, this S here, by T1 over sigma nu Z to the power minus T plus one, and then T minus tau T plus one, and then you have an, a relation between the exponents, one over sigma nu Z equals change of the minus sign, tau T minus one, tau minus one. Okay, which is this one, right? So, this is the, let me try to explain the experimental results that we got. So, we took urethane anesthetized rats, and we measured activity in the primary visual cortex here with um, high density uh, electro uh, silicon probes. So, in those silicon probes, you have a space in between the electrodes which is very small, like 20, 20 something microns. So really you're almost not losing any neuron around this, this probe here. This is the very thing, very close, okay? Uh, and when you measure activity uh, of urethane anesthetized rats, what I'm showing you here is a kind of degree of how synchronized activity in those 64 different channels or hundreds of neurons, uh, almost the order of 100 neurons. Um, what, how synchronized this activity is. The way I'm showing this is through this coefficient of variation, which is very, very rough measure of um, how synchronized your activity is. I'm going to call this the coefficient. The coefficient of variation is simply the standard deviation divided by the average firing rate, collective firing rate. Let me give an example. Let me show you uh, three cases, purple, red, and green, which correspond to purple, small, red, intermediate, and green, high. The CV, you just take this, you have this raster plot here, showing you the activity of all the units in your system, or the neurons, for instance. And here I'm showing you the average, the population firing rate as a function of time, okay? How many neurons are spiking divided by some uh, um, small, Time interval this is one second here for a reference. So you see that you have some variation, but not much. So if you were to calculate the standard deviation of this signal here, it will be something like this size, which when you divide by the mean, gives you something very low. So this is low coefficient of variation, low spiking variability. It doesn't vary too much, the collective firing rate. Can you see this? It's kind of some kind of almost constant with some noise, right? Com com compare that to the other extreme, like this green guy here. What is high CV? It's something which looks like this. If you were to, to, to plug a loudspeaker to your data, it would be something, right? So you have. Your population for rates going up and then going down, going up, going down, going down, 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 and up again and down. So if you were to measure the, the standard deviation of uh, the signal, it's a larger standard deviation. It's 
compared to this, this one. As you divide by the mean, it gives you a, a large number. Okay? Notice that, that this quantity is dimensionless, so I don't have to worry about units. And you, you have some kind of intermediate case here in which you have something in between. And please note the scale here. This is uh, about three hours uh, we have of data for each, for each animal. So in these three hours, this anesthesia is sufficiently stable that you can measure things that for that long, first thing. And you can take like pieces of, say, 10 seconds here to estimate how much CV is. And then you go, you have a long list of CV values here, coefficient variations, spike in variability as a function of time. OK? And this is low CV, desynchronized state. This is high CV, more synchronized. It's less synchronous, more synchronous. If you remember the plots from that Nature Neuroscience review that I showed you, this is awake-like in the sense that it looks like what activity in a wake animal looks like. And this is low wave sleep like. Please, the animal is anesthetized, okay? So it's not, it's not, it's neither awake, ever awake, nor ever in slow wave sleep. So anesthesia is not sleep. It's very important. It's the different things. But this kind of anesthesia and urethane, because of this behavior, is considered an interesting uh, um, system to study uh, brain uh, dynamics as it goes through something that looks like slow wave sleep to something that looks like awake, looks like, has some features of it. You can, you can, instead of uh, calculating this thing here, if you start using the standard deviation, if you use the, the variance, then you have the funnel factor. Uh, the funnel, they are linear correlated perfectly, so yes. So it correlates perfectly with the funnel factor, which has units, so I'm trying to avoid. But, but, but it's okay, units are not a problem. It's just, if you can do it without them, it's fine. Uh, okay, so this is the, the kind of uh, data that you have from this kind of um, anesthesia. And if you look at the histogram of spiking correlation, pairwise correlation, you see the thing that I was describing previously. The, the purple one, again, so low synchronization, you get some correlations which are picked around zero, essentially. And as you go through this more synchronous stuff, it's... Um, becomes more correlated, have positive correlations on average, uh, pairwise correlation between this, the neurons. Okay? So I'm going to consider the CV as some kind of control parameter, not an order parameter, a control parameter that I have no control over, so it's a bit paradoxical, but in the sense that it's, it's a control parameter that the brain dynamics is moving back and forth uh, the way it wants. And it's a way for me to control, to see in that point in time how synchronized the system is. And I'm going to look at different values of CV, so letting the brain itself control where it is, and run this test here, the stress test on criticality. Does it satisfy power, power loss attribution? power law, range distribution, does it satisfy this kind of relation? And if those three are satisfied, the fourth one is satisfied, yes or no? Okay? So, again, low CV, less synchronized, high CV, more synchronized. In order to define spike avalanches, we do everything again, like I showed in the, our, one of the papers in, this, in the second lecture, I think. Uh, Wow, you can barely see anything. Can you see the gray stripes? So you have to bin your data using the usual criterion. You take the interspike interval, the mean interspike interval to use to define your bin. And whenever you have silence, an avalanche stops, and another one ends when it starts again. Uh, so you have avalanche of two, two way, two, six, two, two, lifetime one, one, four, etc. So you have an operational definition of avalanches. 
disregarding the fact uh, if you have separation time scales or not. And therefore, you have distributions of size and duration, and you look at them. That's what we're looking. I'm, I'm taking here just three examples of CV, but I can parse this data with very fine grain detail of, uh, of the CV. I'm taking this three extreme. This is very desynchronized. This is very synchronized. This very desynchronized power law distribution of sizes gives us something that we saw already in the free behaving animals, which is not a power law at all, actually. This, this looks like more like a log normal distribution. In the intermediate regime, I have a beautiful power law here. Uh, with some cutoff, and then I have some kind of ugly power law here uh, in the synchronized regime. And the solid lines here and here in the size distribution and the duration distribution gives you what the standard model, the directed percolation, predicts. So 1.5 for size distribution and 2 for duration distribution. And you see that, for instance, in the red curve here, the exponents are not exactly compatible with this directed percolation versatility class. Uh, but more importantly, I'm just showing you here three different curves. But I have, like I said, I can vary CV very finely. Why? Because I have, I have a very long time series. I can parse CV the way I want, more CV, a little bit larger, a little bit larger, a little bit larger, and calculate those avalanche exponents. And the fact is that avalanche exponents change continuously with CV. So this again throws us back to the results of the cross model a little bit and to the results of the, uh, the magnetoencephalography data from the Palva group in Finland, where you also had these exponents varying continuously. There was inter-individual variability. Here, I'm talking about a single red. The exponents vary continuously with CV. Is there a criterion to choose which are the true ones? So yes. I've told you right in the previous lecture. I've just told you again. So just refresh our memory. People have found non-critical models which satisfy this one. People have found non-critical models which satisfy this thing here. People have found non-critical models which satisfy, which satisfy this thing here. But people have not yet, to my knowledge, found any non-critical model that satisfies this scaling relation. So this is, this is a high bar to meet. Okay, the cross model didn't 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 make it right. The cross model was doing so well here, well here, here, and here it couldn't do it. The cross model. I'm not talking about models. I'm talking about the data. So. Yes, just repeating what I said before, if avalanche size S and lifetime T are power law distributed like this, which they are. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention that, but let me mention before it's too late. Um, when we fit a power law like this, we also run some, quote unquote, rigorous statistical tests to, to probe whether it's, it's okay to say it's a power law. So we run archaic information criterion and maximum likelihood information, maximum likelihood uh, tests to tell whether the power law is better than, for instance, log normal or for instance something. And whenever I talk, whenever I show an exponent, it's because it has passed this test. Okay, just show people because I'm just showing you here some examples. And you could argue that the green line is not not beautiful. Yes, perhaps, but. It, the question is not, not whether it's beautiful, whether it's better to fit this with a truncated power law or with a log normal or, with, or with, with exponential. And the power law beats everyone here, apparently. So that's, that's it. This statistical test. Okay? So if you have the two distributions, then average size should scale with lifetime as this, which is this skinny relation here. And yes, this. Third relationship is also satisfied with the data. I'm showing here average size as a function of avalanche duration in log log plot. The, the slope is this one over sigma nu z exponent for three different values of CV, arbitrary values of CV, uh, small, medium, and large. And this exponent, one over sigma nu z, also depends on CV. So apparently, everybody depends on CV. All those three scaling relations depends on how 
spiking how high spiking variability is, how high, how synchronous or less synchronous your system is, experimentally. If the system is really critical, then the scaling relation should be satisfied. It's, it's the one I did use here, right? And this was brought to the world of neuroscience by uh, John Beck's group, uh, Friedman collaborated in 2012. It's actually a well-known scaling relation. In, it's more, much more general than that, of course. So it comes from Cracking Noise Papers. It's a beautiful nature paper by Setna and collaborators, 2000, I forgot. Uh, very easy to read, not easy, but good to read paper about criticality in general, not in the brain. And again, I make the same comment that I made in the cross model. The two papers were working in parallel, and somehow they met, and it's amazing. Note that this, the two sides of this relation depend on CV, like I showed you, and can be independently evaluated, just like in the cross model. So look, this kind of exponent I obtain from this kind of plot here, at the slope of this plot, whereas the tau t and the tau that appear here come, well, tau comes from, the, from fitting the, the size distribution, and tau t comes from fitting the lifetime distribution. So the left-hand side and the right-hand side, in principle, are independent. And everything in the here depends on CV, which is very random because of the kind of anesthesia that we have. So, is the scaling relation satisfied as CV changes? What I'm going to show you is exactly the same kind of thing I showed in the cross model. Remember, in the cross model, I showed that the left-hand side as a function of one model parameter, and in a different curve, the right-hand side as a function of the model parameter. And remember, those curves, they came together like this, and almost touched it, but they didn't. So they did not satisfy this skin relation. The question is, if you do this for, this for the data, what happens? So in blue, you have the left-hand side. In, in black, you have the right-hand side. You do have a, a clear crossing here. And please note you have different point types. Each different type of point is a different animal. It's a different animal. So individually. Each animal satisfies the scaling relation at roughly the same value of CV. If you want to take an average and take group data, you get this rightmost plot here. So this, as far as I know, is the best documented critical point in the sense that it satisfied, satisfies a very, very strange scaling relation. And it occurs, interesting, at in some intermediate CV value. It's not in the synchronous extreme, nor the asynchronous extreme. Even more interesting, what is this dashed line here? Because, say, you could, you could argue with me, say, okay, okay, maybe you have a critical point here. Okay, I accept that. But this the brain ever visit that place? How often this, do you go there? And actually, the, the dashed line is the residence time, the average residence time across different animals. So on average, not only there is a critical point, as far as we can detect one, using this skin relation as a criterion, but the brain actually, that's where it's most of its time, around this critical point. It hovers around the critical point, the bow, back and forth, blah, blah like it was attracted to this critical point, right? It's being brought back to this critical point all the time, but it's dynamics. But this is during anesthesia. Yes. You hear, did you hear what he said? Say, say it out loud. This is during anesthesia. This is, this is during anesthesia. The guy could be a referee, right? He could be the third referee. Great. Good question. Good point. Also, as a curiosity, at the critical CV value, it's around 1.5, I don't know, whatever, 
we also have one over F noise. So if you make a same CV axis here, the DFA exponent is always non away from 0.5. It's, it's always non-trivial. And it goes to 1, which is the longest possible uh, time correlation you can have, precisely the same point, same CV value. So you have a convergent, you have convergent signatures of criticality, very stringent ones with this extra one on top of that. That's normal. Once you have a nice result, I think it's a very nice result, people will ask you for more, right? Yeah, yeah that's very nice, but it's, but, but it's only anesthesia. This whole blah, blah, blah about criticality is supposed to be used for blah, blah, blah. So when it's statized anymore, it doesn't count. No. Please, come on. OK, the thing is, uh, in order to do the, those experiments, it's, the technique is very important. So this uh, silicon probes, which is this heavy, has this very high density electrodes, are necessary, and apparently necessary. We're trying to figure that out because you have less noise. Because if you have too much noise, you, your evaluation of CV changes because you lose synchronization. You have noise in between those silences. So that's why it's very important. And each silicon probe costs, how much was it, Thais? $1,000, more or less? I don't know. It's $1,000. And if you do in a, in a free behaving animals, you, you, you do an implant once, do the experiment once, and then you have to sacrifice the animal, and your mm, silicon probe is lost. So $1,000 per experiment. We don't have that kind of money, um, but people do in the world. So fortunately, uh, we looked around, and there is free, uh, free, uh, free available data in the litter, in the internet. People have done the experiment with these expensive physical probes with freely behaving animals and put it in uh, for um, public consultation. So we, we went after this data and looked. If we do this with freely moving not rats, they were mice, uh, do we get the same kind of crossing? Is the skin relation satisfied in a freely behaving animal? Yes, the freely moving mice, you, you see the crossing here. And also, is, since we're looking, we also find one anesthetized monkey, one anesthetized with, with a different kind of anesthetic. So frame panel anesthetized monkey, with a very short uh, time series, which is why this thing has so few, few points. But you do find a crossing. Uh, in, you see that the crossing here, it's a, it's a smaller value of CV. It's, this is 1.2. So it's a less synchronous case than in, in urethane case. And you, you're probably noticing the residence time is also biased towards this less synchronized points, therefore away from the critical point, bringing trouble to the whole criticality story. We can discuss that if you want. Uh, let me see, I'm going to the time. How much time do I have? More or less. When does it end? At what time does it end? I think I'm lost with time. Ah, OK. I, was, I finished before that. I think. So, like I said, I think it's a very convincing signature for phase transition because it passes the most stringent test that people have subjected the theory to. And the question is the following now. Now we have a critical point here. What are the exponents? Because I'm not showing you the exponents exactly here, right? I'm showing a function of the exponents, a combination of the two at the same time, so you cannot tell which one is which and how much the exponents are. In particular, are they compatible with mean field direct population? This stubborn theory that people keep using all the time, we keep insisting on it because we understand it. So let's have a look. Uh, I'm showing you here just for the, the urethane anesthetized animals. This is tau as a function of CV. This is tau t as a function of CV. And the scholar stripes, if you can see them uh, 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 yellow here and the green here, are the ones which correspond uh, to the critical CV value here, where, where the crossing is. 
And you see that the, the value here is one point, well, for tau, is 1.52 plus or minus 0 0.09. So lo and behold, this exponent is compatible with exponent predicted by mean field director percolation, which is strange. But so this is, that's the value. This is the, I mean, this is dashed line here is the, the, the theoretical value for that, uh, for that universality class. But tau t, no way. Tau t is 1.7 plus or minus 0 0.1, which is far away from 2. And in order to belong to a given universality class, all your exponents have to be, have to have the right value. And this one doesn't. Therefore, if you accept this as a signature of a phase transition, this phase transition is not compatible with mean field direction percolation. So that model is falsified by this experimental data. We can do more than that. We can go and revisit that plane of exponents, which you see, if I have, a, if I have points here, it's because tau and tau t are well defined, have well-defined power laws. So I can take all the exponents that gave rise to these black points here and put them here in this plane and spread them in this plane. And they spread nicely, again, in a straight line. So uh, the anesthetized reds are the blue stars here. So whenever you see a blue star here, it's because I, I found these exponents in decent power laws with past statistical tests. But now the difference is that it's no longer, this is, I don't consider this, this to be a mess any longer because even though I have a continuous line of exponents, I know that only the ones which are here are the critical ones because these are the ones which satisfy the skinny relation. Now I have a criterion to, I, I can use a criterion to choose, for me to choose these, these exponents. Interestingly, even though the, well, it's not, it should be too surprising, the freely moving mice, the, cross, the crossing occurs at a different point in CV. And correspondingly, well, first of all, the line of exponents, continuous variable exponents, is the same or approximately the same. It's very strange. Yet, the critical point for the mice is different. It's this one, tau equals 1.7, tau t equals 1.9. This almost agreeing with tau t equals 2, but this one doesn't. So it's not mean field direct population either. You get these different critical exponents for anesthetized and freely moving animals. That's okay. I'm okay with that. Because after all, one is one kind of system, non-anesthetized animal, and the other one is a different kind of system. It's a urethane anesthetized animal. It could be different interface transitions. Yes. No. No. We, we work with rats, and they work with mice. For a fish, they look the same, but they are not. Yes. Yeah. So mice. What? That's a good question. That's a good question. So we would love to have data on these same mice with the same anesthesia, urethane, for instance. Um, this is easier done than the freely moving. And it's a task we can do. Uh, freely moving, I don't have the kind of, the, the kind of money yet. Um, but notice that even away from criticality, tau and tau t follow the same linear relation. And this is the same linear relation for different setups. Remember the turtle? The ex vivo turtle, I just grabbed the data, the exponents that they published, and throw them here. It's the, the pink points here. It's, it's an ex vivo turtle. It's not an anesthetic, not a freely behaving mice, but the exponents fall along, more or less, along the same line. Uh, there's there's uh, another paper by John Bax, the Friedman uh, 2012 paper that I mentioned briefly. Uh, it's an experimental paper. I, I took the, just took the exponent from there and put it here and fall into the same line. So to a physicist, this is just irresistible to 
to think that there's something universal here, something's going on because there's, there must be some common mechanism somehow. Because it, I mean, they're falling along the same line. So even though I don't have the, the, the data of the, from the turtle of individual avalanches in order to be able, see, I stole this and this from their, their paper, but I don't have the data to calculate this, let alone this. So I cannot tell whether there's a true phase transition there. But they fall along the same line, which suggests a, um, some common mechanism. The fact that you still have power loss, even outside the critical point, maybe leads us to this Griffiths phase idea. So Wesley Cotta here is an expert on the subject. Um, but just trying to explain very briefly, depending on the So have some control parameter, I don't know, is some, and some order parameter. And depending on, on the characteristics of your system, if you have a system with modular architecture, with some disorder, there are some ingredients in which when you have a phase transition like this with a well-defined critical point, for those spe special systems, sometimes it does happen that even when you are in the subcritical regime here, you have, because of the, the structure of your network, some rare regions where you have some local order, and a little bit here, a little bit there, in such a way that when you do the, the math and integrate over all your system, you will see power law behavior generically even in this, in this subcritical region with continuously varying exponents. This is called Griffith's region. Technically, you're subcritical, but you do see power law, power laws here in some quantities, and exponents vary continuously within this region until you reach a critical point. This is what we're seeing? I don't know. It could be. I just don't want to make the same mistake that people made in the past, just taking one signature and claiming that it's critical. I just don't want to make the same mistake and claim that since I have continuous of varying exponents, I have a group of phase. Could be. Could be. And this linear relation here is reproduced by our friend, the cross model. The cross model is the, the which color is this? Orange triangles here. You remember that it had this, this slope of exponents. Well, I can adjust the cross model so that it passes right through it, even though, remember, the cross model does not satisfy this skin relation. So that's why I called a very a, a good model that almost works for everything I want. It works here to reproduce part of the data, at least, at least this linear scaling between the exponents. So we are, have presented some what we believe to be consistent markers of criticality in spiking activity of the mammalian primary visual cortex, anesthetized and freely behaving moving animals, not only rodents, mice, but also one monkey, at least, very short. The critical point is neither at the synchronous nor the asynchronous ends of the spectrum. And notice how somehow magically, I managed not to tell you what the phase transition is exactly. What are the two phases? And the reason I didn't tell you what the phase transition is is, is because I don't know. I don't know, given those two exponents, what, which universality class does it correspond to? What is the minimum model that can do that? I know the, the cross model comes close, and the cross model suggests some kind of oscillations emerging. But I would love to know what a minimum model is, or even forget about the model. I would love to properly define some kind of order parameter. Remember, I'm considering CV as a control parameter. It could somehow satisfy all the necessary requirements for an order parameter at a phase transition and observe that in the data. I don't know. But the fact that I don't know excites me. I think it's good, because there's work to be done now, OK? And new work forgetting about the mean field direct percolation. So results are incompatible with mean field direct percolation. And again, from the point of view of theoreticians, we need a better model. 
The cross model almost does the job, but one has way, 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 way too many parameters. It's a nightmare. So like a very minimal model in the physics style, can we come up with a minimal model? I mean, the race is open for the Kuramoto people who like to do Kuramoto says, is it a Kuramoto phase transition? Kuramoto-like phase transition with some disorder? I, I'm pretty sure that the pure Kuramoto model wouldn't work, I think, I'm, I'm guessing, but can you modify it? What is the minimal model? So the race is open. You're all, well, all welcome to take part in the race and, and propose models. Um, around this critical point, the avalanche exponents follow a linear relation that encompasses previous experimental results and reproduced by a model, the cross model. So now the criticality thing becomes a little bit strange. You can understand our results along these lines, that if the cortex demands both extreme modes of operation, synchronized and desynchronized, for different functions, it might be advantageous to self-organize near and hover over the critical point between them. So this is the most parsimonious interpretation of criticality, if you want. It's not my favorite one, but it's the most parsimonious if you want. Say, fact of life, experimental data. When you are in slow wave sleep, you are very synchronized. That's, we, we know. When you are attentive, your brain is very desynchronized. We know that as well. And we have to be attentive in order to survive the lions who come after us in the savannah, right? And we have to, be, have to sleep, otherwise you die if you don't sleep for too many nights. For some reason, we have to sleep. So, those two modes are, ne are necessary somehow. And apparently, something very similar to, be, there's a phase transition between something similar to sleep and something similar to awaking, which is what we're showing here with urethane anesthesia. So there's a phase transition between the two. And you have to go back and forth. Maybe it's advantageous to just be near the critical point. That's very par parsimonious without claiming the magic power of, uh, powers of criticality. But there's also, this more important question that can you establish a firmer relation between the phase transition and the behavior transition? Because you see, uh, the paper had a certain repercussion. Uh, some articles about the paper came out in the press, and then all the, 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 the articles were, were along the same, this line of there's a phase transition between sleep and waking. Because it, I would love to say, to be able to say that to you, to make this statement we found a phase transition between waking and uh, slow wave sleep, but we haven't. Our animals are anesthetized. Are anesthetized. It looks like waking and it looks like slow wave sleep, but it's not. And in the mice, which are not anesthetized, we don't have control whether they, of, over the behavior. We're just looking at only one feature, which is severe of the spike in activity. In order to tell and convince a biologist that the given animal is asleep or is, is not asleep. There are other uh, signatures that you have to collect and prove your point, which we haven't yet because we don't have the data. But we're trying to do that. So this is an, a next step to see whether the phase transition we see in the spikes correspond to the phase transition we see in the behavior, some kind of change in behavior. That would be really, really nice, but we don't have it yet. I wish we had. And so please bear with me because acknowledgments will take a little while. It's a paper with, with 12 authors and because it was a course, uh, um, collaboration, very nice collaboration with people from Recife in Brazil and in Braga in Portugal who gave us the first uh, set of data that I showed you actually. In Recife we had only 32 channels at the time, they had 64. So let's do that data 64 channels. Their rats were Wistar, al albino, albino rats whereas our rats were long events, non-albino. So we got the same results in our rats. It was in two different labs. It was very nice. So one by one, Antonio Fontanelli, uh, first author, Nivaldo Vasconcelo was then a postdoc at the group, now a visiting professor at university. Uh, who, those are the guys who carried the piano and did all the heavy duty job of uh, analyzing, crunching the data. And together with Pedro Carelli, who supervises Antonio, uh, with me, with the three of the four of us wrote the paper most of the time. And, but also Thais, who's there, sitting there in the back. Uh, she's magic with her hands in the, in the surgery and obtaining data. And so she made, possible, she made it possible for us to get the data in our lab in the first place, together with uh, Leandro Aguiar as well. Um, Karina Soares Cunha and Barbara Coimbra in Portugal, in Braga, 
acquired the data there. Leonardo de la Porta, my former student in Barcelona, ran, ran the, the cross model. Siddhartha Ribeiro, my good friend and collaborator, knows everything about sleep, and he was very important not to allow us to say much nonsense about sleep. So fortunately, he was there. No, 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 no. This is your thing. This is not sleep. So we didn't risk saying anything stupid, I hope. <laughs> uh, Ana João Rodrigues and Nuno Souza are the two PIs in, in, in Braga. And of course, especially nowadays in Brazil, it's very important to thank the funding agencies. So the, the state agency in, in Pernambuco was where we got most of the money in order to install this lab in the first place. This is the first paper coming out of the lab after, I don't know, many, many years since it was first installed. Also CNPQ, CAPES, federal agencies, and also money from FAPESP here in Sao Paulo in a, in a collaboration with Antonio Galvez in the Neuromath project in uh, University, um, Sao Paulo University. Um, this is part of our group, almost everyone. I thank you and invite you to visit us in Recife whenever you have a chance. Th thank you. And I'm a bit early, so we can ask questions and or drink coffee. Yeah. So, in the case of the turtle, we're looking just at this. Ah, microphone, see. Uh, so, in the case of the turtle, we are just